so why don't we get this live stream started? My name is Levine Hamlani, and I'm the founder and CEO of Accelerate. I'm also the vice president at the AI Society, and it gives me absolute pleasure and honor to be working with Sat China Morning Post to present to you a live stream on the future of computer vision. Uh, format for today is to make sure that everyone gets as much out of this as possible. So if at any point you want to ask any questions to the panelists, to myself, uh, please feel free to write a few things on the chat panel. And uh, we're very much excited to have a, a very, very fun-filled discussion. It's not meant to be just uh, information dispersion. It is meant to be information engagement. So a uh, great chance for us to discuss a very cutting-edge technology and its implications in 2021. So before I get started, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about Accelerate and AI Society and SCMP and what they're doing. And then we can pass it to Michael. So Accelerate's an ed tech platform. We upskill and reskill workforces, governments, enterprises, individuals, and societies with AI skills uh, and talent. We solve the uh, human capital challenges and we operate in multiple different regions across Asia. Uh, the AI Society of Hong Kong is a, uh, it's a society that helps promote the skills and the awareness of artificial intelligence across Hong Kong, uh, across a variety of different industries. And perhaps, Michael, this is a great chance for you to introduce uh, what you and your team are doing, and uh, we'd love to have you get started on your keynote sharing as well. Just one final thing. So format is we'll do a quick keynote by Michael. We'll do a quick keynote by uh, Dr. Yu, and then we'll have a panel discussion between the three panelists. And uh, wrapping around 2.45, we'd love to open up to Q&A from around the world, it seems. Um, so yeah, if at any point you have any questions, just write it in the chat and we want to make this a really uh, information uh, packed event. Thanks again. And Michael, over to you. So hi, everyone. My name is Michael. I'm part of the team of uh, SMP Research here. So what SMP Research do is we provide business intelligence for the leading uh, in industries in China to industry watchers, investors, and other people who are interested in the, uh, in the in the China's economy. So we covered uh, several different industries like uh, AI, internet, fintech, and healthcare. So I'm the lead author of this latest report from SMP Research on China's computer vision. I'm gonna use the next few minutes to uh, quickly introduce to you the key findings from this report, and I'm happy to discuss more during the panel afterwards. So if you're interested, please feel free to scan a QR code at the bottom of the slides and check out the details, including the exclusive discount that we are offering to the audiences at this webinar. So first, why does China computer vision matter? Not only is computer vision technology trailing behind a lot of the AI applications that are increasingly capturing people's attention, like facial recognition, video surveillance, self-driving cars, but also computer vision claims half of China's 6 billion US dollar AI industry. So for industry watchers and investors in China AI, computer vision is definitely a sector that is hard to miss out. But why are we talking about it now? Chinese computer vision unicorns have continued to make global headlines against the backdrop of rising US China technological rivalry. Several of these companies have been added to the US entity list since 2019. However, uh, being added to the US entity list was supposed to restrict their access to uh, US technologies, but this has not seemed to have dealt a deadly blow to these companies. Instead, they are now grappling with significant challenges back at their home market. Security vertical, which is mainly video surveillance, is the single largest end user of computer vision technologies in China. It claims 70% of the entire sector. However, with, with the increasingly saturated market for uh, video surveillance applications in government projects, a lot of the computer vision companies have been forced to diversify and search for growth in other verticals. So the work that we have done to understand this sector include taking a look into the development of computer vision technology and also its market deployment in China. We deep dived into the five key verticals of computer vision in China. 
In addition to analyzing the opportunities and challenges faced by each vertical, we have also drawn ecosystem maps where we lay out the market structure and key players out there. So from this map, we have found that a lot of the bigger players whose name you might have heard of, say, since time, E2, they tend to supply general computer vision technologies to a number of different verticals. While smaller players will uh, focus on developing customized applications for one single uh, vertical. And there are also these uh, big tech companies in China on the right hand side, say Alibaba, Baidu, Huawei, they tend to be all rounded players uh, with businesses across the different layers of uh, the ecosystem. And on a company level, we summarize over 160 computer vision companies in China and also compile their latest funding data as well as data for their published papers and patents. We believe these numbers will help us evaluate and compare these companies in terms of their competitiveness. We have also conducted in-depth interview with executives from leading computer vision companies to understand how they are addressing the opportunities and challenges faced by their vertical. Say, for example, autonomous vehicle. AutoX is a startup founded in 2016, focusing on level four autonomous driving technology. It is one of the leading player globally in terms of testing performance. And tech giant Baidu is also a leading player in the field. As we consider that um, commercializing self-driving technology is a big challenge to this vertical, we compare the different commercialization approaches undertaken by these two companies and have found that AutoX places its entire focus on achieving high level autonomous driving, but Baidu uh, is actively seeking monetization channels throughout the offering of different lower level autonomous driving products. So after vertical discussion, we have also conducted a comprehensive comparison of computer vision capabilities between China and other countries. The metrics we have used cover hardware, data volume, research output, talent, patents, and funding. The conclusion from our comparison is that China still has a lot to, 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 to catch up with in computer vision, especially in semiconductor manufacturing and talent. The country now manufactures only 15% of the semiconductors used domestically. And the number of computer vision talent working in the country is only one tenth of that in the US. And finally, we look deeper into the four questions that we consider crucial for the future of China computer vision. Can China reduce its reliance on the underlying AI algorithms from the US? Can China convince its AI talent to return to the country? Will China be able to manage public opinions on privacy violations? And will Chinese computer vision companies reduce their dependence on manually labeled data? And in addition to the report itself, we have also arranged a series of webinars featuring executives from leading computer vision companies and also venture capital to help us gain firsthand insights into the sector. So uh, feel free to check it out and reach out to us uh, if any question. Thank you for your attention and I'll hand it back to Levine. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you for giving us a very, very good executive overview of the state of computer vision in China. I'd like to open it up to another quick keynote by Dr. Yu. Uh, Dr. Yu, feel free to take over right now. And uh, Dr. Yu is going to talk about how artificial intelligence helps uh, the R&D team uh, in the area that he's working in at TCL and also how he sees the future of computer vision in both Hong Kong and China. So it's my absolute pleasure and honor to have uh, Dr. Yu. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to share my... Uh, slices and my topic is about the computer vision for next generation of display. We just heard about the, how important the computer vision for AI uh, China industries. Actually, uh, I, I didn't see the uh, in your uh, presentations that uh, you talked about the 
uh, uh, industry uh, kind like the TCL. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, I, I will give you a very quickly uh, introduction about the TCL. Actually, uh, TCL uh, has two kind uh, uh, production lines. One is for the semiconductor display, which is uh, we always call it a screen. Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the uh, production for the TCL. And also another is about the devices, uh, home appliance, uh, such as television, uh, you know, the uh, air conditioner, uh, mobile phones, and the smart home. Uh, TCL also produce those uh, productions. Uh, for TCL, uh, uh, we reached about uh, uh, 20 billion US dollars last year for the revenue, and uh, we put a lot of efforts on uh, using the computer vision. Uh, I just give you a very quick uh, overview uh, what we used the computer vision for display uh, industry. Okay, first of all, uh, TCL Corporate Research in Hong Kong, we located in the uh, uh, Sha Tien Science Park, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, more than uh, 50 engineers, and also uh, there's more than 200 uh, overall employees in this building. And we are focused on the R&D for the AI, 5G technologies, IoT. And uh, of course, computer vision is one of our biggest research uh, area. Uh, when we're talking about the semiconductor display, uh, we know it's a screen, but actually at the current world, uh, everywhere is screen. And we'll, uh, we, we, we expect that uh, display everywhere in the future. And from this uh, picture, we can see that uh, semiconductor display from the CRT, LCD, OLED, and QLED in the future, we can see this, uh, the technology changed a lot, but uh, uh, we'll get the better display screen. Uh, not only about the size from the uh, 20 inch to the 85 and the uh, 100 inch, but also the resolution. We can see this, we can got the uh, higher resolution from 4K to 8K. And in the future, probably we have the f uh, flexible display. From the uh, display, uh, TCL already have the whole display ecosystem. Uh, uh, and uh, for the production, we can using the semiconductor display production to television, to uh, uh, iPad, and to the uh, laptop. And when we talking about the display, we can imagine that in the future, when you out of the world, you can see there's display everywhere. And what the display can do, uh, it's not only about the display, but in the future, we said it's a smart display. And if you want to make the display, display smarter, you need AI technologies. And the computer vision is one of the most important technologies and can help the display to be smarter and to be the more interactive with the human. And of course, uh, mobile phones is one of the most uh, uh, human and uh, machine interaction device. And in the future, we can imagine that uh, to using the different display production and the the, uh, the shape and the device, uh, and the shape of the mobile phones will be changed. And now we have the foldable, we have the uh, flexible AI phones. And when we uh, using these uh, smart devices, display is one of the most important that uh, when we buy this product. And uh, now the computer vision can help uh, the, these devices give us the, the best. Uh, experience for the display and to help you to perception and uh, recognition in the future from the display. Uh, I just give you a one of the example. At the current, uh, no matter what you are watching at, uh, television or the mobile phones or your laptops, we uh, when you see this uh, screen is better, you know, uh, better colors, better, you know, display resolutions, better uh, details. Actually, it's used as computer vision. In the uh, old ages, we using the very traditional uh, image processing uh, to help. Uh, uh, display screen to enhance the images. But uh, in the future, we'll use the AI using the computer vision algorithms to combine with deep learning and the computer vision techniques. We can help the display to give the great and the high 
quality of the images. This in this screen, this is just one of example. We can using the uh, computer vision and the AI technology to give you the super resolution to denoising your image to give you the higher definition resolution and the very colorful enhancement results and. Uh, we can, this is just one example. Actually, we use a lot of very similar computer vision technologies to achieve this uh, great results. And there are some more examples. Uh, see the video deep learning, anti-foggy, memory removal, all this computer vision uh, and AI te technologies can help us to give the better display. And of course, we can help, the, help you to you know, uh, enhancement and uh, repair the old films. And also we can compress the video streams to give you the better transformation of the transmission of the display. And this is just one of the example. Actually, we did a lot of the, the, this kind of work to help the, our production to give the better, you know, screen and uh, 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 perceptions of the display production. And uh, yes, and also uh, for the future of the computer vision, we think AI can help the display and the computer vision to generate something that uh, you don't even have it. For example, like this, when we have the one single picture, we can generate the different uh, time of this same area, uh, same place. And this is not about the uh, enhancement, but this is about the AI generation. AI and the computer vision, we can generate more uh, different things. So that's all I can, uh, I'd like to share, but I'd like to uh, mention that this is just uh, one uh, few examples I, I gave today. But uh, if you are interested in the computer vision technicals, we can discuss uh, offline and uh, you can contact with us. Uh, uh, we'll give you the more examples, more very exciting technologies. Also, we have lots of the open positions for the engineers and for the people who are interested in this place. And uh, uh, you are so welcome to join us. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Yu. That was a very inspiring conversation. And thank you again, uh, Michael. So we're on to our last segment now, which is a panel between uh, Michael, um, Dr. Yu, and we also have our third guest, Sedant. Sedant, do you want to just introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ravin. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Siddhant. So, I actually run um, a company here in Hong Kong called Clear Robotics, where uh, we build underwater cameras and AI software, uh, mostly for image detection. For basically building, specialized in building models for image detection, object detection underwater. Uh, and also, our second product is called Clearbot, which is a robot uh, system that goes out and collects trash from water bodies. Um, and we use computer vision again to do object detection on the water surface, detect what the trash is. I it, collect it, and bring it back to show. So yeah, that's kind of what I do. Looking forward to the discussion. That is really, really inspiring using computer vision and AI to make a better planet. Uh, kudos to you and your team for doing that. So again, to all those out there, please feel free to write any questions for myself and the, the panelists, but I have a few pre-prepared uh, questions and any point I'll be looking at the chat to see some of your questions and we'll open up to uh, Q&A from everyone in about 20 minutes. So my first question is, um, I guess, to Michael, uh, how is computer vision beneficial to your company, to your team and, and to your products? Uh I would say computer vision is uh, uh, helps with a lot of the applications we we use. Not uh, not specifically with uh, with SMP, but uh, actually from the sharing of Doctor Yu, we see that computer vision is now everywhere uh, in our daily life. It's in our mobile phone. It's with our television, and also. Uh, Compared to the sector that I just mentioned in security, in, in autonomous driving, actually one of the bigger uses is also mentioned by Sidhan, it's in robotics. And I think robotics and well, in, in a wider sense, intelligent manufacturing is also a very big concept in China as the government is very actively promoting the development on this front. Uh, especially with initiative like Made in China 2025. So I think uh, that will also be another, those will also be the other exciting verticals that are growing in, in computer vision in China. 
Got it. Got it. Uh, Dr. Yu, do you want to talk a little bit more about, so you said some of the benefits to the end customer that computer vision has within um, some of the devices. Do you want to talk more about in general where you see computer vision being most beneficial, not from an R&D standpoint, but currently in application and planned application for 2021 uh, for TCL as, as a whole? Yeah. Macro sure. perspective. Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, uh, today I just about talk about the display because in the in the old ages, we know when we talk about the display as hardware and they using the chips and using the different display hardware technologies to help you improve the display, uh, you know, the image qualities. Uh, but at the current stage, because we have AI, we have computer vision, we can, uh, you know, furthermore to improve the quality of the images, not only based on the hardware, but on using the the, the algorithm, the software to improve that. But of course, when we have the display, well, I didn't talk about the user and the uh, machine interaction. When we uh, have the display, we need a human to interact with our, uh, you know, the, the, the devices and the displays. And this is another, you know, uh, opportunities for the computer vision to help the people to uh, interact with machine. For example, uh, face recognition, that's one of them. And uh, over the gesture uh, detection and the recognition, such like that. And there's, a, there's lots of more applications I can imagine that in the future to like the people interact with the screen. Got it, got it. And Sid, um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about how you guys are using computer vision. You mentioned it briefly, but uh, why is computer vision so powerful for ClearBot and OCAM? Sure, thanks, Levine. So I think it's it's very interesting because there's two things that are happening. And uh, tying to what Michael said, the reason why robotics is suddenly adopting computer vision is because the hardware around CV is changing. So uh, computer vision has always been computationally expensive. You needed a lot of processing power to do uh, basic CV tasks. And so traditionally, you know, how things have happened is you've had a stream of cameras that upload you know data onto a cloud online, and then the processing gets done and returned back to you. But what we have seen over the last five years is you're having companies like NVIDIA, um, even the, the sort of Googles and Intels of the world come out with really powerful hardware uh, that can work on disconnected devices like a robot, which isn't necessarily networked um, up to you know the internet. So um, now what that means is for startups like ours uh, is that suddenly we can use really high power CV algorithms um, and AI in, in literally consumer hardware level stuff, right? Um, and so for us, we specialize in, in, in robotics. And so we're really Really focusing on uh, trying to use these in specific applications. Uh, in our case, it's mostly around the marine sector. Um, but but I think in terms of uh, how the is how we see the industry going is uh, the availability of these sort of high power, uh, high performance GPUs means that. Uh, the one is, of course, as, as uh, Michael mentioned, intelligent manufacturing. I think in heavy industry is going to see a lot more adoption. Um, also, home appliances. I think you're going to start seeing a lot of those sensors replaced by basic CV applications. Um, and so, so yeah, I see, I see a lot more startups like us uh, coming out uh, using these kind of uh, CV technology. Got yeah. Got it. Yeah, we, we work with a lot of leading AI companies in computer vision, and it is a trend that we've also started seeing, the general decentralization of artificial intelligence intelligence, especially from a computing power standpoint. So Michael and Dr. Yu, what are your thoughts in terms of this new trend of decentralization uh, that starts from a hardware standpoint, but also has implications from a software and algorithm design standpoint? Uh, uh, let me take this first. Um, Go for it. Yeah. So uh, there's no doubt that the uh, computer uh, computing power is becoming increasingly accessible to everyone and at lower costs. And and this has, uh, like Sedan has mentioned, this has really uh, empowered a lot of the people to start uh, using the AI and computer vision technologies in their own product. And it's also very excited, exciting phenomenon that we are seeing large corporations like TCL uh, which we might not traditionally have uh, associated it with, with computer vision or AI, they are developing their very robust uh, in-house R&D team to, uh, to come up with their own algorithms and products. And it, I think this has a lot to do with the uh, increasing availability of computing power. And another point I would also 
like to point out is in addition to computing power, actually more and more of the AI and computer vision algorithms are becoming uh, available open source to everyone. This has uh, really, we have seen that this has uh, helped the global AI communities flourish from the uh, US origin uh, co-hosting platform GitHub. And China is also very eager to catch up on this front. And uh, you might not have heard of it, but China is developing its own uh, co-hosting platform called Gitty. It, 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 its purpose is to, uh, to build up the domestic uh, community of developers, AI developers, uh, to, to really form a very robust community to help everyone uh, uh, access the AI technologies that's out there. Excellent, excellent. Um, Dr. Yu, do you want to add any thoughts um, on how decentralization from a hardware and software standpoint is changing the game for TCL? Uh, okay, yes. Uh, actually, uh, not only about TCL. From my point of view, you know, the computation uh, is powerful, of course, with uh, AI, with the deeper learning. And uh, in the last few years, we can see there's a uh, lot of, uh, you know, outstanding algorithms, a lot of outstanding uh, applications. But uh, we also realize that uh, uh, the, they need a lot of the, you know, the computing power. Uh, very high computing power that make that uh, algorithm is really difficult to run on the devices. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a big problem for the most of, of the industries such like uh, TCL. We have television, we have the different uh, you know uh, 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 devices. But uh, if we want to run a uh, computer vision, uh, uh, you know the application, I, I have to make sure that. Uh, uh, algorithm can run on the devices, but unfortunately, based on the uh, you know the production budget, and uh, we have to uh, uh, using some very limited uh, computing powers on the devices. That's uh, very difficult to run the computations on the devices. But also, we can see that 5G probably is another opportunity for computer vision that uh, we can run on the most of our algorithms on the cloud. And using the 5G with the connected mm -hmm. with the devices to help, mm -hmm. you know, the algorithm and uh, the applications extend. But uh, uh, there's still lots of things to do. But uh, I, I hope in the future we can find a way that combine the devices algorithms and the cloud algorithm working together. That's a big uh, that's a big thing actually for the most of the industries. Wow. So it's very interesting because Sedant was saying that uh, many of these devices are becoming strong enough where certain applications can be run on premise, i.e. a small device sensor, what have you. And you were saying sometimes the use case needs much more powerful um, computing power, i.e. just use 5G to bring it to the cloud. So a question for you both is how do you distill the frameworks in mind you know, again, there's many, many different audiences here today. And so how can they try and understand what sort of applications of computer vision are better run, one, on devices, small, uh, big, what have you, but, and then the second one on cloud, and then the third one, both. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's really hard to say if, uh, from my point of view. I give you the one example, you know, for the face recognition, probably you have to run on the devices because, you know, the privacy problem and, uh, you know, the security. Uh, but for some applications for the video, for the video, that's a big data stream. And if you want to run on the devices, you can't stand it on most of the, for example, mobile phones on the televisions. You have to run on the cloud. So this is just one of the example, but I think there there should be a solution. Actually, there is, and uh, we hear about that uh, from Google. They have the federated learning. They combine the, the you know the. Of course, it's not about the computation. It's it's about the machine learning. But uh, it's still the one very good example that you can run some things on the devices and connect with your cloud to deal with some very complicated problem and modeling problem, and then you know mm. you 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 figure this out. But uh, still, I, I, like what I just said, there's still lots of lots of work I have to do. Got it, got it. Yeah, Sid. absolutely. I'll add to that, which is, um, I think there's a basic distinct, distinction. So you have uh, computer vision, which uh, traditionally is like uh, image processing algorithms. Uh, most of those actually the computing parts available today to run uh, pretty much on devices. And then you have machine learning or AI uh, based models. And typically these are more computationally expensive. Uh, but I think in terms of the trend, the, uh, you know, for the first time, I think there's been a real effort on the software side to compress these models. Um, and so what you're seeing is you're able to cut 
uh, I mean, so most of this work is open source, but a lot of these new models, you're able to cut the computational power by half, uh, but reduce the accuracy or the accuracy loss only being about 10%. Uh, and so you're seeing uh, a lot of interesting ways that people are trying to trade off uh, avoiding, you know, going to the cloud um, and doing mm -hmm. things offline and, and, and making more sort of applications available. Uh, but I think, uh, as, as Dr. You said, there's a long way to go in terms of uh, those kind of optimizations because the industry is changing so quick from a, a technology standpoint that uh, you know it, it, it usually isn't worth the investment in terms of time and effort to actually start optimizing something that's going to be replaced in six months. Got it, got it. So that's interesting because uh, Kevin from the audience was just asking to Dr. Yu, um, when it comes to the optimization of the photo enhancing technology, uh, what are the downsides? You know, what are some of the unintended outcomes that come out if the algorithm performs badly, which is, um, I guess, an interesting reference to what you were just talking about, Sid. Well, actually, yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw this question. Actually, when we put this algorithm on the production, we have to test it. Uh, lots of the, and we have to pass the, the, all the testing, you know, process, and we have to make sure that. But of course, it's, a, it's a, we cannot guarantee hundred percent that all the outcomes is a, it's a, it's a perfect. But uh, 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 it's it's happy to to fine tune and uh, uh, renewed again. And uh, but uh, uh, when we put on the production, most of it uh, it can provide the better results. Got it. Got it. Okay. So in our last five, 10 minutes together, I want to talk about the link between um, computer vision and robotics, which is something that uh, both Dr. Yu and Sedant are doing on the ground. And of course, uh, Michael, the SEMP report has been very, very comprehensive in terms of covering. So in terms of funding trends and in terms of just the market potential for the confluence or the convergence of robotics meets computer vision, how is that looking at looking like at a macro level? Uh, Michael, and then we can go into the micro with uh, Dr. Yu and Sid. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so on, on in terms of funding, we are actually seeing the overall funding trend or kind of uh, slow, slowing down in 2019 and actually also in 2020. How, however, uh, it's not all, all negative. Uh, we are seeing increasing funding in, in some new verticals that uh, including robotics. One of the, one of the vertical that we are seeing uh, more funding is in healthcare. Computer vision helps in healthcare uh, with medical imaging and also with uh, uh, genomic sequencing and also medical robotics. So uh, let's take an example of China. In, in China, there was a medical robotics company called Tinavi, which just went public last year. And also, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and this, has, uh, this has really opened up the uh, market appetite or, or exciting the market in terms of the development out there because uh, last, well, COVID-19 last year has been a very apparent uh, catalyst of the, uh, the deployment of different technologies, including computer vision in this vertical. So uh, there, there are more and more hospitals adopting uh, robotics and also, also medical imaging supported by computer vision technologies. And this has not been overlooked by investors. So funding has definitely going up there. So on, a, on, on, on an other perspective, uh, autonomous driving has also seen increasing funding. And that's also uh, kind of spurred by the continued uh, development on the field. Got it. Got it. So in terms of the robotics element, though, are you seeing the growth and the contribution of that market potential grow further, as Dr. Yu and Sid were referring to, or are they all um, along the same lines? I do think robotics is one of the uh, fattest growing uh, vertical in, in, in terms of AI, AI or, or CV. And it, uh, in China, especially, there's a, there has been a lot of debate on how how to how to make a robotics more uh, uh, available in the domestic market because you know China has been relying on foreign suppliers on the key component parts of robotics for a long time, and and throughout the past I would say five years the government has has done a lot of uh, things, including providing funding and, and, and providing tax preference to companies developing 
uh, robotics, uh, especially in, in the medical area and in manufacturing. Got it, got it. So Dr. Yi, what are your thoughts in terms of the convergence? You know, robotics and, and computer vision is a convergence of two exponential technologies. Um, how is that convergence going to shape out in 2021 in China and Hong Kong, in your opinion? Oh, well, <laughs> actually, I'm not a very, you know, expert on the robotics, but uh, I, I just like to share one of the uh, the things that uh, what I know from TCL. You know, uh, when we talk about uh, computer vision, there's also, also another, you know, applications we can think about. We call this smart manufacturing. And actually, we're using the computer vision technologies to help the manufacturer to do the, you know, the inspections. And of course, the robotics in the industry, we can see there's lots of robotics in the industry, like the uh, AGV robot, AMR robot, and also the robot help the manufacturer to do the lots of things. And uh, uh, Everything that uh, it's based on the uh, you know the technologies, but not only the computer vision, of course. But uh, uh, computer vision is uh, the biggest uh, you know uh, uh, technology that we are using in the manufacturing. I just want to put this additional comments. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And over to you, Sid. So your company's entire premise is in converging to different technologies, robotics as a technology and computer vision as a yes. technology. What have been some of the biggest challenges for you in terms of bringing these technologies together as you take your startup to the next level? Sure, I think uh, practically there's a couple of challenges, which is first, uh, it, since it's a new space, it, it's it's riskier, right? And so, in terms of even in terms of raising capital, people are more uh, uh, people are more comfortable investing in a pure software computer vision startup than they would be in a hardware uh, or, or, or something that's combining different parts of hardware uh, and software, especially, right? So, um, I think that is one you know, at, at a basic level, the first challenge. Um, the second is that. So the open source community works really, really well uh, with software because of, as uh, as mentioned, things like GitHub. Uh, but the moment you start bringing hardware into it, uh, it becomes a lot harder to replicate across different machines and then do that kind of development anymore, right? And so I, I do think that that limits how fast you can move in the space. Uh, and practically as a startup, that means that um, it's usually private startups that are putting in the most amount or universities and you know, that sort of stuff. They're putting the most investment in terms of R and D rather than it being a truly sort of open source uh, sort of thing. So I think, uh, I do think that that is an issue. And the final, the final thing is uh, something we're talking about in the chat as well, which is the talent gap. Um, so I, as a fact, the, the number of uh, sort of CS, computer science uh, engineers or, or talent available for computer vision from the software side is a lot more than what is available on the hardware side. Um, and what that means is even for a small company like us, we usually have to train um, our engineers to start dealing with the hardware uh, and understanding the nuances and challenges of working with that. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to start closing these gaps if you want to see uh, development happen quicker and this confluence between uh, robotics and uh, sort of computer vision uh, work out better. Excellent, excellent, fantastic. So one final question for me, um, and then we can open it up to the public. So if at any point you guys want to start writing some of your questions, we'll start going through to uh, Q&A. So question for Michael and Sid. Um, when you think about the leading research in computer visions and um, I guess the application of that research, there's always been a, a time delay or a fuse per se between when something's at research stage and when it starts to become commercialized and when it starts to become from prototype into the mass market. Um, speaking of that time delay, what have some of the events of the last year done to accelerate that, that time delay, the need for startups and companies to innovate further and faster and to reduce the time that computer vision applications, software and hardware stays in prototype stage and gets to the, to the mass market. What are your thoughts on those two cycles? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks Levin. Uh, let me take this. Well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not an R&D expert in, in, in in a te technical sense, but uh, I'm seeing a lot of the uh, news coming out. For example, 
uh, like Dr. Yu just mentioned, uh, the popularity of federated learning. Uh, it just occurred to me this technique is being uh, deployed very fast in China in, in the autonomous driving sector. So uh, China is, uh, is very eager to develop its uh, autonomous driving industry. Uh, and it relies on the technology of a CV2X and also edge computing which is which will need federated learning and i think uh, there is government initiatives and and support for for this research too and and also the government provides uh, i would say a testing ground for uh, for this research uh, to to be really deployed into real products in china so uh, i think that's a way that 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 uh, the research could be uh, the the conversion between research into real product will be accelerated. Got it. Yeah, I can I can add to that, which is um, I do think that if you look at the uh, the gap, the time gap between uh, research to product or it being out of market, China is able to do it at probably a fifth of the time uh, that it takes in the U.S. Um, in fact, funnily enough, I would say a lot of the, the cutting edge research is happening in the U.S. and yet it comes to market uh, in China before it goes out in the U.S. Um, and that's because mostly because of government policy. So the government has been in China has been really, really uh, sort of coming down and, and making sure the infrastructure exists for that resource to transfer out quickly. Fantastic. Great. Well, that leaves me to all of my questions I have for the panel section. Again, we're opening up for Q&A right now, and I'm going to start from the top. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to add them to the chat, and I will uh, pass the questions to our panelists. Uh, the first one for you, Sadan, is from a gentleman by the name of Abhishek, and he asks, um, what are you doing with your company when it comes to targeting water pollution? And what are the possibilities uh, against uh, reversing water contamination with artificial intelligence, of course, or in an AI talk? So, sure. so, so I think, uh, well, what we do very specifically is we use a technology called an event camera. It's a new kind of uh, hardware that's come out. And we, we use that to do object detection on the water surface. Uh, however, I think that, uh, with specific, so that's water pollution. But I think when it comes to contamination, it's a bit more complex because you need sensors uh, that can detect uh, chemical changes in the water. Um, what I think is happening that's interesting is that there are organizations that are taking data from startups like us and other companies, combining it. So they'll take data from us, they'll take satellite data from somebody else, they'll take sensor readings from the government, uh, and they'll use artificial intelligence and try uh, what we traditionally call big data, right? Where we crunch the numbers up and try and do predictions of you know where we expect to see leakages next uh, what kind of risk level is this uh, water body and i think that although it's not particularly reversing its effect it is actually helping us predict and manage resources better so that when there are leakages our governments are better prepared to clean them up um, so i think the, yeah what we're seeing is kind of a more top-down approach uh, of using machine learning and different data sources to make a difference mm -hmm. so tell us a bit more how exactly does your robot i guess find i don't know a plastic bottle sitting at the sure. surface you talked about this event camera um that sounds really cool you know it's amazing to see that you're trying to fight global problems here with artificial intelligence i wish more people thought like you uh but yeah, tell us more about how, how uh, you train that model, how you kind of, uh, I, I can imagine, you know, the data engineering and the data wrangling part for that must be quite cumbersome. So tell us a little bit more about how you prepared the, the right uh, data lifecycle for such a technology to work. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, well, I'll start by going a quick summary of how it works. I mean, pretty much uh, we have a, a kind of robot boat um, and it goes along a, a path and as it sees something in the water, as the camera detects something, our model has been trained uh, to first do a basic object detection uh, where, where it just says, okay, there is an object and this is the position of that object. And then second, it does an image classification where it figures out what kind of object it actually is, whether it's a bottle or a piece of wood or you know, some kind of plastic. Um, 
And so while we were doing this, so this, this technology is very mature in, uh, in terrestrial environments, right? It is the uh, CV or AI that we've all come to know. But the thing is in water, things really change. So in water, it's a very chaotic environment. It's always moving. Uh, this is gonna have reflection and you know, a whole bunch of these sort of environmental constraints. And so one of the, the things we're using is this, what, what I mentioned is an event camera. Um, and what we, so a, a typical camera just you know uh, takes images at let's say 30 frames per second so it's giving you effectively 30 images every second and then your machine learning model is just processing that video um, but what an event camera does is it only returns a frame if there's been a significant change in the environment right uh, and that's actually how human beings see and so it's it's changing the per perception of how a camera looks at things from a hardware level and i and i do think that in the future we're going to see some really interesting applications especially with autonomous driving uh picking this sort of technology up um and so yeah we basically were working on technology to to do that detection and uh as you said one of the biggest challenges for us has actually been getting our data right uh, so we, funny enough, we work here with a lot of NGOs to try and get pictures of trash. Um, but I think where where the efficiency, is really, yeah, where I think the efficiency is really improving is in the labeling. So two years back, you actually had to label each image pretty much by hand, right? Like one by one, and you and what we're seeing now is this software that we use ourselves. We buy it from another startup, uh, but that basically is helping you automate your labeling. So you you label the hundred images, uh, and the labeling tool is predicting. Uh, on its own, you know, what object might be there. And then so it makes it much quicker. Uh, and I think that stuff like that, you know, the whole sort of ecosystem around this has helped us accelerate uh, what we've been able to do. Excellent, excellent. Okay, great. Um, Michael, when you think about the um, South China Morning Port, uh, South China SCMP uh, research report, what were some of the applications that you saw uh, of artificial intelligence and computer vision um, in these areas, I guess, environment related, climate related, uh, was that something you covered or were you more covering, I guess, the healthcare and education and manufacturing and retail? Did you cover energy, for example, computer vision and energy? Uh, well, uh, we didn't write specifically in, into energy or, or environmental protection, but I, I do think it's very inspiring what Sihan's company is doing on, on this regard, deploying computer vision in, in, in fighting pollution and contamination, because um, I think a lot of the a lot of the hurdles of computer vision deployment in, in real life is increasingly having to do with uh, privacy concerns with facial recognition technologies. And that is increasingly uh, really prompting, prompting the companies to rethink their strategy of deploying such technologies. Uh, how, however, in regards to deploying these technologies in robotics, in, 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 in manufacturing, there's less such concern. And what Sihan's company is doing is, is providing real benefits to the human society. So that's going to be a very uh, big catalyst for, for growth in, in the future for, for computer vision technologies. Fantastic. Awesome. Just as a reminder, we have another five, seven minutes left in this webinar. So if any of you in the audience have any questions for Sid or Michael, please feel free to let me know. Um, I'd like to talk about the talent gap and the human capital shortages, because this is an area that I find very, very passionate about as well. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit more about the talent gap, skills gap, human capital challenges that affect not just AI as a whole, that's very generic, but maybe computer vision as a whole, um, um, in Hong Kong and in China? I'll say the problem with talent uh, specific to China and Hong Kong or, or, or in China is that um, the country is failing, has been failing to attract the talents to return to the country because many of these uh, students uh, were trained in the US uh, in, in leading US universities. And they, they after their graduation, they just stayed in the U.S. to to work, but but not return to the country, uh, out of the concerns about uh, salaries and also uh, you may have seen the news about long working hours in uh, in, in the tech companies in China. Um, but we are we, we we have been seeing uh, the government has to do something about it. Um, 
uh, raising salary and also providing a lot of the subsidies uh, to to encourage more students to come back to the country. And, and I think a lot of the homegrown uh, educational institutions are providing uh, like, like Accelerate is providing similar uh, training to, to, to provide more AI or computer vision talent uh, uh, within the country instead of uh, uh, asking them, uh, well, instead of they, ha they have to get this training uh, in the US. Got it, got it. Sid, a question for you. So I'm sure like many young gentlemen in I guess fresh grads or graduating right now, there's a lot of classes and courses that are now being taught at these universities. There's a lot of master's programs as well. Um, do you feel like such programs uh, are preparing the next generation of AI talent to become leaders in the space, build companies that fight global problems or innovate and do R&D, particularly in Hong Kong? That's a really great question. So I do think, uh, uh, I mean, Michael's right. Most most people prefer to you know go to the U.S. to study there and just stay in the U.S. Uh, whether it's working for someone there um, or doing further R and D. Um, Hong Kong's interesting. I do think uh, in Hong Kong uh, the quality of research is high. Uh, in terms of computer vision, there's, there's some good you know stuff happening here, uh, but I think uh, Hong Kong lags in, behind in terms of uh, being able to convert that. So we're in a, we're in a funny place where the, the the academic level is not as high as the U.S. So you're not putting out that high quality research. It's so pretty don't... high though, like for computer vision especially and, and deep learning. There's a lot of yeah. papers that come out of the universities in Hong Kong. Oh, absolutely. But so, so my point was more that, uh, you know, so you'd either shine in terms of the pure academic level of what you're putting out, uh, or you shine in terms of converting that into, you know, into uh, market ready products. Uh, and so Hong Kong's in a funny place where they're in between the China and the US, uh, where the US is, is a lot of the top universities in the US putting out uh, more, you know, sort of earlier research, uh, while China is able to convert that faster into, into companies. Um, and so Hong Kong is an interesting place, I think, for talent because by nature, it, it for, not forces you, but it, it sort of encourages you to move out. Uh, so I think actually the, the talent pool in Hong Kong is usually limited. So if you see a lot of the computer vision startups, they prefer moving uh, over to China, right? Or even if they're based here, most of their work's actually done in China. Um, um, I also think a second challenge is that if you look at uh, the sort of structure here, uh, a lot of a lot of the talent that's coming out uh, of, is very focused because as a student, you just want to do artificial intelligence, right? Uh, but as a result, they, they don't understand even like sort of basic computer vision concepts. Uh, and that actually affects the quality of work that's being done because the, ten, the trend now is to just uh, kind of abuse machine learning and the machine learning will figure it out when there are smarter, more efficient ways to solve a lot of problems. And I think the, the one thing the universities are failing at is, uh, encouraging people to do it the old school way as well, right? Have an understanding about why that works uh, and where machine learning has advantages and where you do it uh, the old way. So because of the because of the sort of pressure to put out research papers, I think there's a trend where we're just seeing people just doing machine learning no matter what the problem is. And that's not necessarily yeah, healthy. It's very concentrated and doesn't show, I guess, the contextual and domain specific applications uh, for, for why such knowledge is useful and where the pitfalls are. Yep. So it sounds like we're running out of time. Um, do you and Michael want to say a couple of last words to the audience and then we can wrap up and also please feel free to put your LinkedIn, uh, in the chat so that if anyone wants to ask questions, they can also reach out to you, you guys separately. Uh, sure. I, uh, okay, let Michael go first. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, just at a, at a quick note, uh, if any question, please feel free to reach out to me or to research at smp.com. Uh, we're happy to answer any question. Awesome. Yeah, Michael, maybe you can put your LinkedIn and uh, the research at SEMP uh, at the bottom of the chat. Yeah. Sid, any uh, parting thoughts? Uh, well, I would say I'm personally really excited to see how things work out over the next two or three years in this space. Um, and yeah, and if you want to get in touch, I've put my LinkedIn up in the chat. I'm very happy to share and learn what people have to say as well. So cheers and uh, thank you so much for coming here. Very inspiring what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. Very, very inspiring work.
Keep it up, man. Go change the world. Awesome. And thank you again, Michael. Always a pleasure to partner with South China Morning Post. And uh, again, for all those of you who want to see this again, it will be recorded and put on the Accelerate YouTube channel. We look forward to working closer with uh, SEMP to continue to put uh, cutting edge thought leadership and get experts to do webinars just like this. Uh, if you want other webinars in other areas about AI and how it's changing the world and certain industries, please feel free to reach out to us. And uh, we look forward to having more of these very soon. I hope you're all safe. Uh, I hope you're uh, all have a great day ahead. And thank you again for joining us.